Hello, hello. How are you doing? Good. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. I've got YouTube following me here. So there uh, we're, we're live as well. I'm going to throw our videos on up to the channel in just a second here. All right. We've uh, there's been a few changes since the last time I, I chatted. I think you knew we talked a couple of years ago and uh, this is pre acquisition. So you were Engageo before yeah. still still with Engageo pre acquisition to uh, demand base. Yeah, yeah, it was about almost exactly a year ago when we brought Engage and Demand Base together. So it's, you know, been a big year in more ways than one. Right on. I I was saying I'm I'm always excited to to get a chance to talk to you. I was just telling Sarah that I think before our last conversation, we were talking about the for, for your contribution to Impossible to Inevitable. I I'd heard about ABM and I was like, yeah, it's sort of like you know, just named accounts sales like everybody else was doing for you know the last 20 years and then we had a conversation about the different styles and the methods and the ways and just i appreciated your clear thinking on the subject in 20 minutes i walked away went oh okay i get it um and the okay. fact that you were heavily influential in the i you know what is now the inbound marketing space um with the founded you know the founding of marketo and and then engage you so always great to have you here i'm really excited for our conversation today absolutely totally <clears throat> Perfect. So, yeah, so I've got the presentation ready to go when, when you tell me when to rock. Yeah, why don't we just, so I, I've kind of talked about how I know John, um, but for those that aren't, that haven't met him, he's currently the chief marketing and product officer at Demandbase, responsible for their entire account-based go-to-market. Um, I've, I've mentioned some of the, the other hits, but John, is there anything else that I've, I've missed other than sort of generally influential, somebody that you should follow? created the inbound marketing space? Well, I wouldn't say I created the inbound marketing space, but you know, as, as a co-founder of Marketo, I certainly, I think helped uh, contribute to that. And yeah, today's presentation all is all about kind of what's next, kind of where's this all going? Perfect, ready for your slides whenever you got them. All right, let's rock, let's, let's uh, rock this show. Uh... <clears throat> all right, we good, we full screen here? You got it. Awesome. So yeah, so this presentation is really all about uh, where where's the whole world going? And just as a kind of a sneak peek to the end, it's something I'm calling account-based experience. Not even account-based marketing, but account-based experience. So we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, but as we as we as we you know I were just talking about, I was a co-founder at Marketo. You know, we started Marketo late 2005, early 2006. Uh, I can keep track of that because it was almost exactly the same time as my son was born. Uh, and he's, you know, uh, 15 and a half now or so. So, um, you know, back then, you know, Mark, you know, when we started, when we started Marketo, there was a very kind of almost specific set of problems that marketers were facing, which was really, we were generating online leads uh, at scale, really for one of the first times. I mean, Google AdWords really only got up and running in like 2003. So this is just two years after that. And marketers needed a place to capture these leads and score them and do something with them if they weren't immediately ready for sales. And that ultimately was the rise of account-based marketing. Sorry, the rise of marketing automation. And you know, at the same time, you know, this marketing automation tools like Marketo were also the email tool. And it was sort of the rise of, of uh, a lot of use of email, especially in B2B for the first time. So marketers owned the actual keys to communication with customers. And then it, it was a pretty exciting time, I think, for marketers, because we sort of were able to evolve from being the people who threw parties and made color brochures into being, you know, really, truly part of the revenue engine. But as I said, that was almost 16 years ago. And obviously, the world's changed a lot since then. You know, and ultimately to the point that I think, you know, that traditional model has almost gotten kind of shipwrecked, you know, and it's looking pretty decayed. So there's, I got kind of five things here that I want to talk about in terms of how that world has, has really changed. You know, the, the first one, we already talked a little bit about account-based, you know, a second ago, but we've, we've realized that we sell to businesses and not to people. That at the end of the month or the quarter, the sales team doesn't talk about how many leads they closed. They talk about how many accounts they've closed. And so we've seen a whole bunch of marketers 
start adopting account-based strategies because it just makes a lot of sense. So, and whereas the traditional marketing automation solutions are really built around the lead, not, not the account. So that's the, that's the first big change. Another one that's a little bit more subtle is the changing dynamics between marketing and sales. Built into marketing automation like Marketo is the concept of almost a linear baton handoff where marketing will generate those online leads, nurture them until they're ready, pass them to an SDR, like a baton, who then qualifies it and passes it to a sales rep, if appropriate, who then gives it to a customer success manager to kind of run from there. But, you know, we've seen these big changes. You know, at the, at the bottom of the funnel, you know, buy committees are getting larger and salespeople can't individually be talking to, you know, all of those people in the committee. And so we're seeing more marketing playing a bigger role in the bottom of the funnel. And at the top of the funnel, you know, we've seen, you know, GDPR and other privacy regulations change how much email marketers can send. And then the rise of outbound tools, right? This is what predictable revenue does. Um, where you've really seen a lot more email coming from at the top of the funnel from the sales team, not the marketing team. That baton handoff is looking increasingly broken. And, and what we need is something that looks a lot more like a, a soccer match where the ball is passed back and forth, um, you know, as opposed to the baton, linear baton handoff. A third big change is the rise of recurring revenue models. Now that's obviously important in software as a service, but almost every industry is sort of adopting the subscription economy. And what we're seeing is that uh, built into tools like Marketo is a focus on almost you know, the net new lead, you know, if you will, the you know, new, new business. Um, at Marketo, we even would um, ignore a response if it came from an existing customer. And yet that's exactly the opposite of where the revenue comes from. The revenue comes from post post sale, retention, expansion. And so there's this real disconnect between the way the marketing systems focus on new business and the way that businesses run, which is really on the kind of post sale revenue. A fourth big change is how buyers are buying where they're doing their research. An exciting part of traditional marketing automation was the ability to track the digital body language, the ability to see uh, what people were doing on your website, you know, what content they were clicking on, what emails they were opening. But more, uh, you know, buyers have gotten savvy. They know if they come to your site and fail to form that you're gonna start emailing them and calling them perhaps with unwanted outreach. So they're doing more of their research anonymously and more of their research off of the website. And so we need new ways of sort of tracking who's interested in our products and our solutions that go beyond what marketing automation can do on our own first party properties. And then the fifth big change I wanna talk about really is just digital transformation. You know, and this was driven by COVID, you know, massively. I mean, we saw six months of digital transformation happen, sorry, six years of digital transformation happen in six months when all this hit last year. Almost overnight, traditional marketing tactics like events went away and marketers had to move their budgets online. We saw that demand base with a mass amount of investment into things like digital advertising. And even as we start to reopen and things are coming back to quote unquote normal, you know, once you open Pandora's box, you can't put everything back in. I think this sort of move to sort of a digital go to market is, is really, really here to stay. So these are kind of five key trends that have made the traditional marketing automation approach, the traditional demand generation approach look increasingly outdated. And a lot of people have talked about account-based marketing as the next big thing, the next evolution, if you will. In inevitable to impossible, uh, you know, and this analogy originally came from Aaron Ross, that you know, traditional demand generation is like fishing with a net. You don't care which fish respond or which companies respond, you just care if you catch enough. Whereas the account-based marketing world is much more like fishing with spears. Uh, you identify the big fish and you go after them regardless, you know, uh, you know, based on kind of their interest. 
if you will. It was a really good analogy, and I think it really helped explain the rise of account-based marketing you know, over the last four or five years or so. But I've increasingly been realizing you know, we're in this world, as I said, where buyers are smarter. You know, they, they're more in control of the process. And as a result, there's a flaw in how we think about traditional account-based marketing, which is you know, that built into the traditional outbound models, built into fishing with spears is the concept that we're gonna go after this account, even if they're not, the timing isn't right or they're specifically interested in hearing from us. And you know, to put it simply, getting poked by a spear doesn't feel very good. And I realized we need a new model, you know, one that combines the precision and targeting of an outbound account-based model but with the engageability and improved uh, customer experience of traditional inbound or demand generation. And that's what I'm calling account-based experience, this kind of next big thing. Um, and so in many ways, account-based experience combines the best of ABM with the best of the customer experience movement, if you will. So let me talk a little bit more about ABX. I mean, first of all, one of the things I like about it is that it's inclusive of multiple departments. The name account-based marketing by definition only includes one department, marketing. And as we've learned, that doesn't work very well. So one of the nice things about ABX is that it really is an umbrella that lets marketing and sales and sales development all kind of be, be part of this new next generation process. But the, really the second part that I think is so exciting is the fact that it uses intelligence and insights to know, you know when and how to engage with each account and what to say so that you can be more relevant. Rather than interrupting the account because we decide it's time to reach out, we identify the right time to reach out and are therefore creating a better overall account experience, if you will. So that's the idea. That's what's the next big thing, is this a kind of account-based experience concept. What I wanna do with the rest of the presentation is to really now talk about how do you actually do it? How do we get this up and running and implemented in our organizations? And so I have sort of the five steps to developing account-based experience. And step one, is building your account data foundation. That's our journey to the promised land here. So what do I mean by building your account data foundation? Well, if you go back to my time at Marketo, you know, when I was starting to do eight account-based marketing or outbound programs to complement our traditional demand generation, I'll be honest, I drove my marketing team, my marketing operations team in particular crazy because I wanted to do things like identify the right accounts and orchestrate complex account-based programs and measure the results. And it was just frankly really, really hard given the disjointed systems that we had. It was that experience that ultimately led me and inspired me to build Engageo, which was something that would help you create a single comprehensive view of the account across your first party data. And that's really stuff on the left here. You know, you, in order to be account-based, you want to have sales and marketing looking at a single view that matches, you know, that pulls data from the CRM, your marketing automation, your web visits, your, you know, even your email server and your calendar is a wealth of amazing information about what's going on at the account. And then you need to do something called lead to account matching so that you can take all these individual people and make sure it rolls up to the right account. And that's what Engageo was really good at. But to really have a full view of the account, you need to marry that first party data with third party data. Things like good quality firmographics, revenue, industry, location, uh, hierarchy data, technographics data. If you're a software business, knowing the other technologies that company has, can be incredibly valuable. It's actually probably one of the most predictive factors in terms of knowing which accounts are gonna be a good fit for you. 
even things like intent signals and context, and then the ability to match all that to the right account, you know, is what you, the, it sort of forms the foundation of everything that you do that's account-based, and then keeping it cleaned and maintained. So we're talking about data here. It's not always the sexiest thing. A lot of times marketers and salespeople are like, get past the data. I just want to go do the cool stuff. But the honest truth is, without a quality account-based data foundation, you're always going to sort of be pushing a rock uphill. Once you have that data foundation in place though, now we're really ready to rock. And uh, we get to the exciting stuff, which starts with like, let's go pick those accounts. Let's really identify the ones that are gonna really move our business and drive us forward. Now, the challenge we have when we do that though, is that at any given point in time, the number of accounts that we might possibly wanna go after is way larger than the number that we can effectively actually go after um, at any given point in time. And so we need strategies to kind of focus in on the right accounts at the right time. And there's really three strategies we can use. The first one is to tier your accounts and treat accounts differently. More valuable accounts should get more focus. It just makes sense. But not every company does that. <clears throat> the other two strategies are about kind of having a rotating spotlight that sometimes is gonna put extra focus or energy on certain accounts, either because they fall into a target segment or some set of conditions or rules are met that sort of say, hey, let's focus more. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about each of these three strategies. The first one, as I said, is different uh, tiers of accounts. And you know, to understand that, we need to really get into the different styles of ABX. You know, Colin, you were talking about this a little bit earlier. So at the very top of the pyramid, we have what is known as traditional one-to-one -one marketing. You know, this is where you are going to do completely customized programs for each account based on a deep account research. This style is really effective. And it's really expensive. Companies spend on average up to $50,000 per year per account to make this work. Uh, it, it's worth it for the big seven figure deals, uh, eight figure deals, if you will, but it's not very scalable. The median company only can have 14 of these accounts. So, because it's not scalable, we have other styles. The one to few style you know, it's really focused on micro clusters um, where you're gonna do deep research on the clusters needs and then customize, you know, a moderate amount, you know, based upon the needs of that specific sub, sub vertical, if you will. It's about an order of magnitude smaller spend and it's about an order of magnitude smaller deal sizes. You know, this is good for your 300, 400, $600,000 deals, million dollar deals even. Um, the, uh, the, the median number of accounts that a company has in this is about 50. Typically, it's going to be the dozens. The, the third level, one to many, this scales to the hundreds. The median number of one to many accounts is 500, and some people have a lot more, although they're probably using a rotation strategy. This is, by definition, a more scalable approach, broader programs, lighter personalization, more use of technology, less investment per account. And then at the very bottom of the pyramid is what I call targeted demand generation. This easily scales to thousands and thousands of accounts because all you're really doing is your traditional non-personalized demand gen, just going after a name list of accounts. I'm not saying one style is better than the other. In fact, the best companies use a mix of all three or four different styles based upon their ACVs uh, and their business. The key though is to not have too many in each given tier. If you sort of try to have 50 one-to-ones, you're not really doing one-to-one. -one. It's just not possible to scale at that level. So to make that work, I strongly recommend that you, what you do is you define your entitlements or your definitions of each tier before you pick the accounts. Go in and sales and marketing together, write down if you have a one-to-one -one account, what do they get? What are you going to do? What do sales do? What does marketing do? What's different if you have a one-to-few or a one-to-many account? 
you know, and then you can even have additional rules about, well, if that account starts showing specific engagement or interest, what I call a marketing qualified account, I'll explain that more in a minute, what additional entitlements are they going to get? And so when you've done this, it starts to tell you your constraints of how many accounts you can actually have. So this, these are what demand base actually uses. You know, if you're going to do a hundred dollar gift or a cameo message for every account that shows uh, buying intent on the one to one tier, that adds up pretty quickly if you have more than a few accounts. And if every account gets an account plan, again, you're not going to be able to scale that more than to a handful of accounts. So, step one is define your entitlements and then use that to indicate how many accounts in each tier you can really have. And hold to that so that you don't end up watering uh, out and diluting what you really want to do for each account. And then from there, we have to now start picking the accounts. All right, let's say we get 10 in the one-to-one -one tier. Well, how are we going to pick the best 10? And so on. And that's where AI and big data start to really, really help. And there is an acronym I like to use to help us think about this, which we call FIRE, F-I-R-E. So the F, this is the fit. These are the accounts that you want to go after because they look like your best accounts. This is how much are, you know, how good are they? How easy are they going to be to close? How valuable are they going to be? And again, machine learning can sort of take the universe of 20 million accounts and rank them for you based upon the quality. The I in FIRE stands for intent. Now we can do a whole presentation just about intent data. But intent is sort of is the ability to, to know what content companies are consuming out on the open web, not on your website. And there's lots of ways you can get to this data. You know, vendors like Demandbase can provide it. But it gives you an understanding of the baseline of what a company is interested in. <clears throat> and when you see trends in it that sort of all of a sudden a lot more interest happening from account, it could be a sign that that account is sort of entering into a buying cycle um, and it's worth kind of maybe reaching out to. The R stands for relationship. This is your context and history with the account. Do you have a closed lost opportunity there? You know, or maybe your SDRs are already reaching out to the account. This is all important information to understand if it's an account you want to go after. And then the E stands for engagement. And this is really, are they spending time with you and your company? This is your traditional marketing automation, but rolled up scoring, but rolled up to the account. Are they visiting your website? Are they downloading your content? Are they attending your events? And then you can combine all of those into another score, which we like to call pipeline prediction. Uh, it's really your in-market uh, buying prediction. Which accounts are showing the pattern of behaviors that your other accounts have shown on your site and off your site as they lead up to becoming an opportunity with your business. If you can calculate all these scores, either using just manual rule-based scoring or better AI, um, now you're armed with how you can then go uh, pick your best accounts. This spreadsheet at the top is an indication or is a, an example of how we do it at Demandbase. We give each rep a sheet that has their territory with some basic key technographics and firmographics, and then the F, I, R, and E scores that we then combine into a single score, and it's sorted. And then the rep can basically go in and say which of these they want for their allotment of the one-to-ones and one-to-fews and one-to-manys. For us, each rep gets about five one to up to five one-to-ones, up to about 30 one-to-fews, and then about 100 or so one-to-manys from their total territory and everything else falls into that kind of targeted demand gen bucket. So it's marketing driven, but sales owned. They ultimately own the selection of the target accounts, which is really important. At the bottom here, you also see how we do that other two strategies, that rotating spotlight, if you will. For example, you know, we might have in different quarters, different campaigns we run focus on different industries or different programs. This is sort of giving extra entitlements to those the accounts that match that segment so that we can get even more focus. And then we have the triggered one. So as I talked about accounts that are entering in a buying cycle, we, what we call NQA, they always get extra entitlements. 
Or if a company in our target account has a new executive or starts showing intent for our competitors, those all trigger extra entitlements and extra focus. So that's how we pick our accounts and, and then focus on, on some of them more at different points in time. Okay, phew, take a sip of my drink here. We've got our data foundation. We've identified and scored and ranked the accounts. We know who we're going after. Now it's time to actually go after them in a very orchestrated, coordinated way. The problem we've got is that our buyers are living in this overly crowded, crazy world where we're not the only ones going after them. There's a whole bunch of other companies trying to do the same thing to the same busy executives. And there's no way we're gonna stand out if we are being generic. However, 75% of executives say that they will respond to an unsolicited outreach if it contains ideas that might be relevant to their business. Where relevant is based on a knowledge and understanding of their industry, of their unique business, and gives them fresh ideas. This is the challenge for salespeople, but applied to marketing and prospecting. So executives will respond to our outreach if it's at the right time and it's relevant. <clears throat> so how do we get that relevance? Well, you can do manual account research, which you should, especially for those one-to-ones and one-to-fews. But we also wanna to touch more accounts than that. So this is where you wanna start maybe using technology to help bring relevance in a more scalable way. <clears throat> so there's a whole bunch of ways you can do this. Where the account is in its journey, which I'm about to talk about in more detail, tells you a lot about what's gonna be relevant to them. But so does that intent data. If you know an account is, you know, is, is researching digital security, you know, you know that might be the thing you might wanna focus on when you talk to them and also what words you should use when you talk to them. You know, industry tells you, um, you know, a lot of the challenges they might be facing, the technologies they use are really, really important and, and so on. So, um, you know, use technology where you can, use research where you can to get those insights and make sure you're personalizing those interactions a la the challenger sale. Now, I've talked a lot about the buyer's journey. And I, I, it's time to sort of address that in a little bit more detail. I love this research from Gartner. They basically describe the buyer's journey is that before a company can buy a job or can, can complete a buying process, they need to complete these six jobs that you know, kind of roughly happen you know, from identifying the problem all the way down to building consensus that they made the right decision. However, as Gartner points out, Buyers do not move through this process in a linear fashion. They go through what's called looping. And it's a very non-linear process as they kind of bounce through uh, their, their buying journeys, if you will. So how can we put some process on top of this, you know, when the process itself is very non-linear? Well, I think there's a great sports analogy we can use here. Think about an American football game you know, where the path that ball takes as it heads towards one or the other end zone is very nonlinear. Forward, back, passing, kicking, you name it. You know, and so just like our buyer's journeys, that ball is on a nonlinear process. But the yard lines still tell us a lot. You know, for example, they tell us how likely we are to score. If we're on the fifth yard line, we're much more likely to score than we're, if we're way back on our own 20. Similarly, they tell us what kind of plays we should run. You know, if we're first in goal, we're going to run the ball. You know, if we're third and 20, we're probably more likely to pass. And so even though the process is nonlinear, by putting lines on it, it helps us understand the process. And that's what we should do for the buyer account journey as well. And we can do that, again, using these scores that I talked about earlier, the fire scores, and use them to map to a set of account stages. So this you know, is one set of sample stages, um, which I'll explain. This is what we use out of the box, but then we highly encourage companies to customize these to match their own business. You know, don't follow one vendor's 
fixed set of rules for how the stages should be, you know, they should match your own business. But here's what we do out of the box. So at the top, you know, the qualified stage, these are those accounts that have a good uh, fit score, if you will, that match our ideal customer profile, but they aren't otherwise further down the funnel. The accounts that are in the awareness stage are showing intent, the I uh, from FIRE. So they know something about our category, but they're still not interacting with us. The engaged, now that's the, engage, the E from FIRE. They are coming to our website, downloading our content, attending our webinars, but they're not showing signs of actually being ready to talk to the sales team yet. That's what the MQA stage is all about. This magic moment, if you will, when an account is open to a relevant outreach, you know, but before they've actually come to your website and raised their hand, or worse, engaged with a competitor. You can identify these accounts using that pipeline predict score that are in that magic moment and reach out at the right time. You're gonna dramatically improve your chances of winning the deal. From there, you create you know, opportunities, customers, even have post-sale stages. What's exciting about the ability to start to understand where the account is in the journey is it then lets you align your go-to-market to the right interactions to the right stage, which is you'll recall is exactly uh, the definition of what I said is account-based experience is all about. So at the very top, those qualified accounts, we wanna go after them, but they're not showing any interest in us. We should just focus on building our brand. And brands are built on emotion. So, you know, we're not trying, don't try to get a click or a direct response or a download. Just build your brand on a foundation of trust. As they become aware, as they start to engage with you, you start to earn the right to move from emotion to logic. Start to engage with thought leadership and best practices and education. You're not trying to get a meeting yet because they're not showing any signs of being in market, but you're trying to lay the foundation, you know, so that when they are in market, they're going to want to talk to you. When the account hits that MQA stage, that's when you kind of go after. That's when your SDRs start doing outreach, your salespeople do outreach. You might, as I said, you know, look at what we're doing. We do cameo messages, direct mail, uh, gifting, all sorts of good stuff to engage that account when they're in that magic moment. When they're in the opportunity stage, here's where you want to focus on those last two jobs from Gartner. Help to, first of all, reach the broad buying committee, you know, build consensus, and then you know, help build validation that they made the right decision by sharing analyst reports and references and things like that. And then obviously after the sale, continue to enhance that post-sale experience. You know, this is the most important personalization you can do. At Demandbase, we change our website and our advertising to match all of these. So as accounts are moving through the journey, uh, they get the appropriate interactions from us. And, you know, which leads us to like, all right, how are we actually interacting <laughs> with our accounts? And Topo research shows there's a bunch of different channels people use. Number one, I think music to this audience's ears is the SDRs, outbound. You know, it's important, it's, it's uh, people are using it and they're pretty satisfied with it. it. Is, you know, in terms of satisfaction, it's second only to digital advertising in terms of um, uh, a channel people are using. So, you know, SDRs are the tip of the spear. But you also have events and one-to-one -one outreach from executives, gifting and direct mail, advertising, they're all super important. Um, but more than any one channel, what's important is making the channels work together in an orchestrated way. You know, think of it as the orchestra conductor. You've got your wind instruments, your percussion, your strings, they all are important. But when you can make them all work in harmony, that's going to be your most effective way. Um, so this is what the whole con when you hear the word orchestration, that's what we're talking about. It can be as simple as marketing and sales working together. It can be more sophisticated. And the play really is the, the glue that ties it all together. So, you know, think of, you know, back to football, you know, X's and O's on the chalkboard, right? You do this, they do this, you're going to do that. 
it literally outlines what each member of your team does to really connect in with, with the target account. There's a bunch of kinds of plays you can run. Um, I've got you know, a book where I try to talk about all of these, but as you kind of think about it overall, it's basically kind of an if this, then that sort of, you know, set of, set of things to sort of think about. You know, if you've got a, you know, the fourth one and the where account where an executive from one of your accounts shows up and maybe registers for a webinar, that's great, but why not actually offer them a customized one-to-one -one meeting with a subject matter expert? You know, rather than with the speaker of the webinar, for example, if they're a valuable enough account, why not give them that one-to-one -one experience? Or maybe, you know, you have an open opportunity that uh, is got sort of stuck, if you will, but then all of a sudden it sort of lights up again. You know, that's a perfect opportunity to alert your sales team and start reaching out over different channels. Um, there's all sorts of plays you can run here, you know, limited only by your imagination, but what they all have in common is they orchestrate all these different human and automated touches together. Okay, which brings us to our fourth step here, which is really a, about getting marketing and sales working together. Inherent in all those plays I just talked about is marketing and sales working as a team. And I've talked about this at the top of the presentation. We need to move from a baton handoff model to one that looks more like a soccer team where you've got players in different positions. You've got your forwards and your fullbacks and they each have a role to play, but they still work together and pass the ball back and forth to make it work. According to Topo, this is the number one indicator of account-based success is when your marketing and sales and SDR teams can work well together. And there's four levels of sales and marketing alignment I want to talk about. Sorry, three levels of sales and marketing alignment. Um, the first one goes back to my foundation. Just having marketing and sales looking at the same data is essential. You know, because if you're looking at different data, if marketing is counting leads and salespeople are counting accounts, you know, you're not aligned. And so that data foundation is step one. Step two is to start doing alerting, letting them proactively know key insights. Some of the plays I just showed you are examples of this. Hey, did you know your target accounts visiting the website? Did you know you have an account in your territory that's showing intent for purchase? You know, by giving sales teams proactive notifications about key insights, you help them do their job better. But then the highest level of alignment is that true soccer team set of coordinated interactions. And you can do that through orchestrated plays. And you can also do that through what I call an ABM or an ABX standup. Honestly, folks, this is one of the most important you know, actions I hope you take away from today. Just get a meeting that has every two weeks, the sales rep, the SDR, and a marketer. You know, that's it. And the agenda of the meeting is let's talk about that rep's accounts. What's happening in their territory? What engagement are you seeing? How can we actually reach out and engage with more of the right people at those accounts? It's not hard to do, and I've seen this work wonders at companies to get sales and marketing working together and to really kickstart an account-based program. All right, we're getting near the end here. I know we only have about five minutes left, uh, which is just right in terms of timing. I wanna wrap with talking about the fifth really pillar here, which is measurement. And we could spend a long time on that, but I'm only just gonna hit two key points. The first point is that in this account-based world, we're measuring quality and not quantity. We don't really care how many leads we get. We don't care how many people attended our webinar. What we care is, are the right people from the right companies attending the webinar and responding to our campaigns? It's about the quality of our relationships and the depth of our relationships. Or as David Ogilvy says, don't count the people you reach, reach the people that count. And so there's lots of ways you can think about evolving your metrics to be more account-based, but perhaps the simple and the most obvious is to move away from a lead-based funnel and towards an account-based funnel. So many of you probably have seen the serious decisions waterfall and are used to MQLs and SQLs, SQAs, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, the 
you know, in an account-based world, you want the same kind of concept of a waterfall, but it should just be measuring accounts by stage using these four key metrics. The value is how many you have at any point in time. Volume is movement. You know, like how many new MQAs did we create this quarter? <clears throat> Conversion rate, velocity, super important to understand the overall health of the dynamics and the funnel. Marketers and sales teams that have these metrics in place can get really good at forecasting because they really understand the dynamics of how accounts move through this journey. So to wrap, I do get questions about ABX technology. Um, so I wanna have two slides on that and then we'll wrap with how to get started really quickly. So in terms of technology, you know, I am an ABM vendor, an ABX vendor, but I do want everybody to understand that ABX is not a technology category per se. It's a business strategy, uh, first and foremost. You can do ABX without much technology, but if you want to get good at it, if you want to scale it, you're probably going to need to invest in some technology. The account-based leaders do spend more you know, than other companies. In terms of where do you invest in the technology, you know, there are a lot of subcategories, if you will, um, whether it's uh, building that account foundation or finding the accounts that matter, engaging both accounts across all these different channels, orchestrating the interactions, closing and measuring the results. Um, the good news is there's this it, companies like Demandbase, Sixth Sense and Terminus that are really coming online that bring a lot of these key kind of pieces together. Um, and into what we call the account-based platforms. So this Topo research really shows, you know, which technology categories people find impactful as well as satisfaction. You know, in the upper right, you have the account-based platforms, as well as people who are getting started with th simpler things like lead to account matching and just account-based advertising, um, buying the right contacts, kind of near the upper right. So phew, that was a lot to cover. Um, but as we said, you know, marketing automation is kind of the last decade's news. And the next decade is about this concept of account-based experience aligning our interactions with the right accounts at the right time. There's a lot you can do. I covered a lot of best practices here. Um, you know, I just want to jump ahead one second and we'll go back. The good news is I just wrote a book. It launched yesterday. Um, it's 250 pages of best practices on how to do this. It goes into everything I covered in a lot more detail. You can actually get a free copy on our website at demandbase.com slash ABX. Um, and as I said, one of the things that it, it covers is how can you get started really, really quickly. So if you just do any or all five of these things to get started, you're gonna be really off to the races. Defining those entitlements. You know, as I said, that's your that that's so critical just to get going. Um, you know, and then and then using some kind of methodology to then pick accounts that sales and marketing agree on. You know, if you really want to get started easy, just doing some advertising to your in-market accounts, you know, that are showing intent. What's so easy about that is you can literally get started tomorrow. No, no meetings needed. You turn it on, ads start showing up at the right accounts, traffic goes up. Mapping leads to accounts. That's that foundation I talked about. You know, even if you aren't going to build all the data foundation, just getting people rolled up to the right account is really essential. Doing some basic sales intelligence and getting those ABX standups is a great way to get started. And then if you're a little bit more sophisticated, launching a simple integrated play, uh, one that combines, for example, something like a direct mail package with the SDRs following up. So there you go. That's all about what's next, the account-based experience. Um, I'll be jumping over to the Slack channel for Q&A. And um, with that, Colin, anything, anything else? I, I just wanted to highlight, like, this is, I, I love your approach here, John. Um, love that you're of, you know, obviously coming from a vendor, but the, the comment about ABX is a strategy and not a, a, you know, a tool or a tool category, I think is, is very apt, very accurate. And I love the, um, I love that you're sort of not just, I mean, obviously the demand based logo is here, but you named a couple competitors. And I think that, you know, it's a, that's a great thing to, for you to stand up here and be able to do. Let me get back to one person here, two people. I'll get my video going, just changing up. Every time we, uh, we change the zoom layout, I got to change the, 
the Streamlabs layout here. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get like a dedicated broadcaster, but for, for now, it's me. Um, I did want to highlight one thing, and I know you said it a couple of times, but I did want to highlight the, the ABX stand-up. I think that's probably the most incredible point we've heard all day today that there's so like people talk about sales and marketing, not working together. It's like the definition of like the, the actual visual, like how it happens is meeting. And there's so many times that I see salespeople not meeting with their SDRs sales, you know, sales, not meeting with marketing. It just, it's such an obvious thing that I don't think many people are doing. It, you know, I, I... You would think it would be more, but if I look at our best customers, it's probably the top 15% of customers that have implemented it, you know, and there's, there's nothing, there's no thing you can do that has as high a benefit to effort ratio, uh, to get sales and marketing working better aligned. Right on. John, I appreciate you coming on here. I, I had a feeling you were going to end with a book takeaway. You've always got a book. I love your books. <laughs> this one is really it. hot off the press. We launched it yesterday. You know, it's my ninth one I've written and it's the best one yet. So you must be a pro at writing books now. Uh, I think I am developing a little bit of a best practice, you know, set of skills around it. It's very niche, niche skill, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the one takeaway I had from our previous conversation that is stuck in my head. And every time somebody's talking about inbound, outbound, I remember you said, you know, you, you reached a point in Marketo and in Marketo's journey where you recognize that you couldn't just write another ebook and sort of hit the, hit the growth numbers that you had. Um, yeah. I wonder if that's, if that's still the same, if it's, is it just like another book, another outbound campaign, another X, is that still true? Still holds? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, you know, great content is still a really important marketing strategy, both, you know, for building your brand as much as for driving the you know, direct response. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I think getting, getting just the, the, the best practices out there is a really effective top of the funnel strategy. But if you want to drive pipeline, as I said, like, I, you know, I'd rather have one really awesome, clear and complete guide, you know, mm -hmm. that builds my brand than, you know, the 10th ebook, the 12th ebook, you know, cause there's absolutely diminishing returns and there are other outbound tactics like we talked about that can be more effective for engaging the right accounts. Are, are you going to legally change your middle name to clear and complete or, or is that the <laughs> John, I appreciate you coming on. Um, I'm absolutely going to pick up my copy of the book. I appreciate the, uh, the offer. Everybody can grab one. Uh, Julia just threw a link in the chat. If you've, uh, if you want to grab your copy there and, uh, John, if people want to reach out and, uh, and track you down, what's the best way for them to get in touch. Uh, if you want to get me personally, just shoot me a note on LinkedIn, uh, John Miller too on LinkedIn. And, uh, if you want to, Sort of just learn more about demand base, obviously through our website, but check out the book. That's probably the number one thing I got to say. Right on. As somebody who's read a, a bunch of your books, I don't think I've got all nine, but uh, I've got at least two. <laughs> um, I highly recommend them. Definitely check them out. Thanks again, John. Thank you. Bye, everyone.